So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this second half of our morning session. And now we switch uh, topic, subject, and go over to basics of quantum measurement with quantum light. And our first speaker will be Michael Hattred from the University of Pittsburgh. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Today we'll be talking about the, the first part of a three-part series on the basics of quantum measurement and quantum light. Uh, VJ will be uh, sharing these honors with me. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, but through the wonders of the internet, he is judging me from behind these cameras, and tomorrow he will be that camera, which will give the second talk in this lecture. And the overall uh, point of this series is basically to talk about how in the quantum computing tinged world of superconducting circuits, but also how in the related communities of optics and optomechanics, uh, we can build quantum circuits, we can impinge quantum light on them, and we can then uh, measure the properties of those circuits or even manipulate those circuits with quantum light. And in the way we are going to present this talk, which is sort of superconducting device centric, this is going to devolve into an extended conversation on something called a parametric amplifier. And we're going to try to convince you that these are uh, both very interesting open quantum systems. They are not qubits that are designed to retain their information in some closed circuit. They're in fact designed to transform light that passes through it and not retain it at all. And uh, so in that sense, they're a very interesting theoretical topic. And they're also a very hot experimental topic. We're both experimentalists here because you need these circuits in their tens and hundreds and someday thousands uh, as part of your quantum computer. Okay, and I should say this is supposed to be pedagogical. Please stop me as we're going along if you have any questions. Uh, if you're especially quiet or I talk especially fast, I have a fun uh, audience participation thing at the end. Okay, so just to get everyone on the same page, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about quantum light, and I'm going to start with everybody's favorite version of quantum light, or at least uh, most people's, the Fox state. So we're going to imagine that you have some harmonic oscillator, we're going to quantize that harmonic oscillator and find that a nice way to express its quantum state is in the term of this uh, number state basis, to say that the quantum state of the harmonic oscillator has some number one, two, three, four, five photons in it, or some superposition thereof. And uh, this number operator, uh, sorry, the, this number states, of course, eigenstates of the number operator A dagger A, where these are the usual uh, creation and annihilation operators. So that this operator acting on n gives us, oops, just a number times the original state that we have. I think that's pretty standard for most people's uh, quantum mechanics. The way we like to look at these states is a little bit different, is in this thing called IQ space. IQ space sort of has a very classical analog if you have some oscillator. It's oscillating with some amplitude and some phase or some in-phase and quadrature phase component. That is, if it's sinusoidally varying, you can talk both about its distance from the radius and sort of what its phase is, or we can break that down into the sinusoidal part here and the cosinusoidal part there and plot this in a 2D phase space. Quantum mechanically, uh, you can really think of this, if you prefer, as the X and P operators of a harmonic oscillator. Our harmonic oscillators are electromagnetic. There is no mass. There is no momentum. So we sort of have this more uh, maybe abstract looking basis of I and Q, which is just A plus A dagger and A minus A dagger. Again, this is decomposing the light in terms of its um, two quadratures of oscillation. If I look at a Fox state in this basis, it kind of looks like a donut. It starts as a blob at the center for the vacuum state, which I'll show again later. And it is a series of concentric rings and IQ space that get thinner and thinner as they move further out away from the origin. This is maybe the most theoretically uh, handy description of a harmonic oscillator. The most natural description of a harmonic oscillator, at least in terms of its classical analog, is this thing called a coherent state. So a coherent state is the qu quantum equivalent of what happens when I have a massive spring system and I drive it harmonically. I drive it, let's say, at its resonant frequency. Then uh, in terms of this Fox state basis, the coherent state described by this complex coefficient alpha is e to the minus alpha squared over two as a prefactor and then a sum over all possible Fox states, oh shoot, where there's a missing in here. Thanks for catching that, VJ. Uh, and you see in general then that a coherent state is a summation over all Fox states. 
And it has this weird property that it's not an eigenstate of the number operator. In general, it has every number population that you'd like. Instead, it is a, a uh, eigenstate of the lowering operator. So the coherent state, kind of counterintuitively, is the state where when you pull a photon out of it, nothing happens. And you just get back this complex coefficient alpha here as your prefactor. And, and don't ask me what happens when you add. Don't do that. Uh, in IQ space, it's basically its length, the magnitude of alpha, is given by the length of this vector here. And then uh, I can express the center in I and Q space, this I bar and this Q bar, as the real and the imaginary components of this complex coefficient alpha. So alpha is really describing where it is in phase space. And then it has this Gaussian distribution, which uh, my limited artistic skills here have rendered as this kind of blob here. OK, so that's a coherent state. Of course, there are much more exciting states of light than just these Fox states and coherent states. Uh, one other sort of interesting state of light we'd like to think about, and it's going to be relevant to these lectures, are squeeze states of light. So here's my Fox state, and here's my coherent state on the same page. If I had drawn them uh, accurately, you'd see that these two things have the same area in phase space. Again, there's distributions here I'm just drawing as, as cartoons, but they these really have the same minimal area in phase space. And one of the fun and interesting states to think about is to say, okay, what if I have a state like this, this coherent state, and I try to squeeze on one of these quadratures? To maintain this minimal area here, that means that the other quadrature has to stretch. So these states are called squeeze states, and it really is sort of you imagine that they're made out of Play-Doh, and you just squeeze them one direction, they will extend in the other direction. You can squeeze along the Q-axis, Sorry, the I axis here, so the I axis becomes squeezed, the Q becomes anti-squeezed, you can squeeze along I, or any axis that you choose. Okay, so the next question is, if I've generated one of these states of light somewhere in my system, and I'm, I'm going to talk specifically here about flying states of light, so I have this propagating in some transmission line, some fiber in free space aimed at a detector, the next important, oh, sorry, uh, the next important thing to think about is sort of what to do with this. So uh, everything is quantum mechanical in the universe, at least according to our understanding. Uh, what's the point? So if you're an experimentalist like me, uh, first, the, the sort of basic thing you do is to try to detect and measure this light. You want to prove that it has the right quantum properties. Associated with that, you may have heard of things like Q function or Wigner tomography. In the optics community, they, they talk about time-time correlations or spatial correlations of light. Or again, here, bunching and anti-bunching. These are all just different ways of looking at these quantum properties of the light. Practically in the laboratory and in your everyday life, we use light as a sensor in sort of too many ways to count, right? We use light to detect vibrations, to detect temperature, to detect basically anything you want, anything we can tie to the state of light that we then detect. The, the third application is really the one that Vijay and I focus on, which is using it for quantum information. And here, really, it's going to act as a flying information carrier. If we do a good job of it, you really could start to see it as a flying qubit. And the sort of number one by volume places people use these flying qubits is actually as sacrificial quantum systems in the readout of another stationary qubit, okay? And, and sort of unpacking all of this is really what's going to happen in tutorials two and, and three of this series. Okay, so now, now getting back to the detectors that I'm going to use to interact with this light, the uh, detector that we build, at least in its sort of quantum ideal version, is going to perform some specific transformation on the light. One sort of detector maybe people have heard of, it's very popular in the optics community, is something like a click or a photon counting detector. This is a detector where basically where if there's no light, it doesn't click, and if there's some light, it clicks. Or the more advanced version will sort of click and give you a number, saying 0, 1, 2, or 3 are photons. And what that means in sort of a mathematical language is that it's going to project us onto some Fox state in where the probability of getting that particular click, the click 0, 1, 2, 3, is given by this overlap integral between in and whatever light we feed into it. And if I have now a superposition, let's say, of two coherent states here, 1 over root 2 alpha 1 plus alpha 2, versus over here I have a uh, superposition of two Fox states, you'll see that this detector really handles these two situations very differently. If I think about some particular nth state of the detector that it could go click into, here's this representation in IQ space of Fox state in here. And you see here, it nicely overlaps with the 
with the Fox state on the right. It really nicely projects you onto N, and this state N is orthogonal to this state M. So this detector is going to very rapidly allow you to know, basically, for instance, what is this prefactor here? What probability do you have of this nth state versus this mth state in this distribution? Over here for coherent states, it's really very muddy, especially if these coherent states have the same radius. You see that here, basically, the overlap of these two states is sort of equal, and it will definitely try to project me into some Fox state, but that Fox state, for instance, will not do a good job of discriminating which of these two coherent states I'm in. So you really have to match the detector that you're using to the source of the light. So if you are in an optics experiment where you tend to generate Fox states, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, it's very advantageous to align them with this sort of Fox state detector on the back end. In our superconducting circuits, we focus more heavily on coherent states of light. And that means that we need a detector that's not a Fox state detector. It's going to have many of these same quantum properties. It's just going to be more aligned with this idea of detecting where in IQ space you are. OK, so now, before we really work up to this, which is the subject of today's tutorial, I want to take a little brief um, sidestep and address some of the properties of a classical amplifier. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So. Um, there are different kinds of tomography. There's this sort of Q-function tomography or Wigner tomography. The simplest thing to do, yes, uh, you're right. Um, I'll show you, you know, this is again a Fox state detector, but if you just imagine that this was a classical voltage distribution, I would just measure it over and over and over again, and I will get plots that just like, look just like this. I will show you a lot of plots just like this. There's a wrinkle here for quantum light that there's a superposition here, right? And that superposition can undertake some arbitrary phase. There are uh, more complicated schemes, some of them involving Fock detectors, that, for instance, Wigner tomography try to displace this state and then do Fock detection to extract this phase. Uh, that's not something we're going to tend to do with linear amplifiers. But you're right. Uh, in both of these scenarios, of course, reconstructing something like this technically takes infinite, kind, uh, infinite number of measurements just to get the probabilities, and extracting the phase, the full tomography, is much harder. Uh, process tomography is a different question. It's basically saying... You are restricting to state tomography. That's right. State tomography is hard enough. Process tomography is another layer of hard. Uh, that's right. So just for people who don't know the difference, uh, if I have a reliable way of generating this state every time on purpose, then tomography is just a way to basically uh, extract that. Or to say, if VJ could generate for me some state I don't know over and over and over again, then tomography is the process by which I would extract from measurements, this distribution here. Process tomography is saying, I don't trust VJ. So VJ will do various uh, scenarios of creating different states. I will do various scenarios of detecting different states. Uh, and, and that's basically the maximum amount of information if you trust nothing. Uh, but we're not ready for that kind of discussion yet. And, and in general, we're not going to present any tomography, sorry, any process tomography data in this, in this tutorial. We'll present a lot of regular tomography data. Yeah. Oh, OK. So. Uh, back to my diversion. So clearly we're not going to use a Fox state detector, um, but let's talk a little bit about a classical amplifier. And I put microwave here. Of course, this could be optical, this could be audio. I just tend to always think in terms of microwave because that's where we work in our superconducting qubits. So this amplifier is designed that if you have some incoming wave coming into the input port, it'll be absorbed into the amplifier, not reflected. And out the output port will come some amplified copy of this signal. This is all perfectly classical. And usually we describe this amplifier by some gain. Often we use power gain. So here working in voltage units, this is again root G. And then the amplifier adds some noise, which I've just sort of represented here schematically by this N. OK? And here's a classical IQ plot here. Again, you think cosine component, sine component. There's a signal represented by the centroid of this object. It has some noise already on it. The amplifier can't do anything about that. What the amplifier actually does is just to run it through. And I'm going to do this funny thing where I divide out the gain of the amplifier. The reason I do that is to make it clear here that what the amplifier does is it makes things worse, right? Uh, you often will think, like in your stereo, I have a preamplifier and it makes the signal to noise better. I don't mean that it improves this signal to noise or it even maintains this signal to noise. Actually, what amplifiers are for is to allow you to use junkier components, noisier components downstream, 
And so basically, it amplifies the signal and its noise and this added noise so much that even though the secondary components behind this guy add tons and tons of noise, you've pre-amplified this noise and this inevitable contribution enough to swamp everybody else. So the noise performance of this guy here will determine how much noise is added to your signal. So this is the point of an amplifier. They really degrade the signal-to-noise ratio, and their job is to swamp the downstream noise. I think this is very counterintuitive, because if you sort of, maybe I shook you awake in the middle of the night and asked you what an amplifier for, you tend to say it makes things better. You have to be very careful about how you define what it makes better. What it makes better is your tolerance for the downstream components. Okay. So this is all very classical. And these are very uh, commodity items. You go, in America at least, to this company called Mini Circuits, and you buy them. Here's some data sheet I stole. And you see here uh, that they have many properties. These are complex engineered things. They have gain and gain flatness and output power saturation and third order intercept power and input viswer and output viswer. Um, all of these things should have some quantum equivalent. But the number one thing that sort of uh, people who design parametric amplifiers set out to conquer, the number one first and foremost problem here was this idea of the noise added by the amplifier. It's really what makes this thing a classical amplifier. And um, this goes by a lot of names invented by engineers. It goes by the term noise figure, noise factor, sometimes noise temperature. In this uh, tutorials, we're going to try to focus a little bit on noise temperature, but mostly on this idea of how many quanta of noise. So if I were to say, this is an amplifier at 7.5 gigahertz, and I would cal characterize that noise power in terms of how many quanta of noise power that is. Now that's going to give us the figure of merit. The next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the quantum limit of that, uh, but you can probably suspect already this particular amplifier with its noise factor of 3 dB adds 830 quanta at 7.5 gigahertz. And I, I, you already expect probably that 830 doesn't sound like a good number for quantum mechanics, right? It should be 0 or 1 or something like that. Okay, so the question here uh, is, if I take this kind of amplifier and I ask ourselves, what does quantum mechanics say about how much noise the system must add? And so this is due to caves in 1984. And if we start by sort of considering a vacuum state, so this could be zero photons, or you could think of it as coherent state with zero amplitude, these operators, I and Q, they don't commute. And like any non-commuting pair, they're associated with a minimum uncertainty. So that minimum uncertainty plays out as a minimum area here in phase space with an equivalent energy of half a photon. This is the, a half in the n plus a half h bar omega of our harmonic oscillator. So any coherent state here, sorry, in this case a vacuum state, but any coherent state or minimal state will have the same area of a half a photon. So if I redraw that same diagram from a few slides ago, now this is the quantum version of the IQ plane. This, again, will be the amplitude alpha, complex al amplitude alpha of my coherent state. This width here will be this minimum uh, area of a half a photon. If I pass it through the amplifier, again, dividing by gain so it fits on the page, what Caves taught us is that the minimum added noise, so the total distribution of noise here, will now have one photon of total noise. So in my bookkeeping here, a half, this first half photon is exactly these same quantum fluctuations. They just pass through the amplifier and are amplified. The other half photon is the minimum added fluctuations by the amplifier. And uh, this is going to turn out to get a little tricky later on. Um, if I just want to say, how well does this final state overlap with the initial state? So final state here, initial state. It is true that this is added noise. What I'll show you in the third tutorial is really if there's two quantum inputs to this, what it's actually saying is something about the entanglement of two disparate sources of light. Um, that sounds a little mysterious, and I'm going to just leave that be, but we'll come back to it in, in tutorial number three. Okay, so the quantum limit says we must add a half a photon. So you now see clearly that adding 830 photons is far away from the quantum limit. And sort of the, the quest that, that several of us started out on was to build devices that could push down to this number. Okay, so to give you sort of a little bit of a skeleton here now with that, what we're going to do in the rest of this talk is sort of talk about what a parametric amplifier is to try to give you some derivation of sort of how you would think about a Hamiltonian and how it results in a device. Uh, we'll classify them. There are a lot of different flavors with a lot of confusing names designed to keep us uh, busy. Uh, there are some important limitations of these devices that are still subjects of ongoing research. And because uh, 
Because all of this is very general, throughout the first sort of 70% of this talk, I'm just going to talk about Hamiltonians, and I'm not going to bother with how I make them. But of course, we do make these things in the laboratory, and we make them with superconducting circuits. So this will end with a little bit of an introduction to superconducting circuits, which leads us into tutorials two and three. Tutorial two is, is Vijay's tutorial on phase-sensitive amplification, which is a, a little bit different, and we'll talk about that uh, later in this talk, just to introduce it, with these superconducting circuits. He's going to show you, can we do single-shot qubit readout? This is an important figure of merit for your quantum computer. And then on this, in terms of discovering interesting quantum mechanics, he's going to talk about weak measurements and quantum back action of individual measurements in these systems and show you how he can actually entangle multiple quantum objects via sequential measurement. Tutorial three, which is me again, will follow sort of the same construction here, except we'll go back to how, how we use these phase-preserving amplifiers. They behave a little bit differently. They, they also achieve single qubit readout. But the weak measurements and the quantum back action they do is different, and the amplification process is different. So we can actually talk a little bit at the, at the very end about entanglement via the amplification process itself. OK, so onwards to this intro to metric amplifiers. So how do you build one of these classical microwave amplifiers? And this is, oh, I forgot the reference. This is from Sandy Weinreb's website. He is one of the sort of best makers of classical low temperature uh, cryogenic microwave amplifiers. So what these engineers do is they take inductors, capacitors, resistors. You can see them here. There are these little elements. And crucially, they take transistors, which are powered by DC voltages to provide the nonlinearity that's at the center of the amplifier. I think you've all seen transistors in your basic electronics class and know that they have nonlinear IV curves. If you bias them to an appropriate uh, place, you can get a lot of voltage swing on the output for a small voltage on the input. That's the heart of the gain process. All this other stuff is to manage their microwave properties to get light in and out in the way you like. And if we want to do the same thing, but in the quantum world, most of these things have direct analogs. So the inductors and the capacitors, we also use inductors and capacitors, except we consider them to be quantum harmonic oscillators. So there's going to be some conversation about the frequency of the system and how cold it needs to be to really be in the, a quantum state here. Resistors, we don't use in the same way. If we want dissipation in the system and there are certain scenarios where you do want to dissipate light, we tend to do it uh, through a port. That is, we tend to couple the light out into some well-controlled medium so that we're in charge. We really don't want internal losses in these systems. Internal losses are not going to do anything good for us, uh, or at least uncontrolled internal losses are really going to be our enemy. And now the transistors plus <laughs> DC voltage for the gain, uh, this is where there's going to be some variety depending on what physical system you're working in. Basically, uh, at this abstract level, you're going to need some nonlinear uh, Hamilton coupling Hamiltonian, and you're going to need some par parametric drive that's going to basically drive these quantum oscillators and turn this into the thing that powers the game. OK? All right. So now, uh, before we talk about parametrically driven couplings, let's just talk about a simple coupling. Let's imagine. And you could pretend this was a spin. I've kind of drawn it here as two balls. These are each meant to represent a harmonic oscillator. So they each have some uh, Hamiltonian, which is omega A, A dagger A for A, and omega B, B dagger B. And the interaction between them, if I just sort of directly hook them up to each other, is going to be G, A, B dagger plus A dagger B. So this is a standard hopping interaction uh, which, in which photons from A try to hop onto B and vice versa. So if these two frequencies, omega A and omega B, are very different, in particular if they're very far separated compared to their, their line widths, kappa A and kappa B, this term in our Hamiltonian tends to die due to the rotating wave approximation. Basically, it costs a large amount of energy to make this transition here. There's no source that powers this system. So if you take the two harmonic oscillators and you put them on resonance, they'll talk to each other. You drag them apart, they won't talk anymore. Uh, it turns out uh, this kind of direct interaction is also used for qubit controls. It turns off in a way that's, that's uh, slow, slower than you might want for a qubit control for the parametric amplifiers we're talking about today, where we really would like it to be big, strong, and under control. This is maybe not so relevant of an issue. Okay. The parametrically driven exchange here. So this is going to be basically the same kind of idea of photon swapping between now these two modes, and I'm going to add this third sacrificial mode here. So 
these guys each have the same harmonic oscillator, individual Hamiltonian, omega A, A dagger A, omega B, B dagger B, omega C, C dagger C. The interaction here now is going to be a three-body interaction. So for instance, A, B dagger, C dagger, plus A dagger, B, C. So you see I've added this C and C dagger onto the end of the interaction that I started with. And the trick here is that C is really not going to interact with any drives or signals near its resonant frequency. So C is going to be an empty mode in its vacuum state. I'm going to drive it, but I'm going to drive it at a frequency that's very far away from its, uh, from its resonant frequency. And in particular, if I drive it at some frequency, omega C, that's not its resonant frequency, but, but it's instead sum of these two. And if the sum of these two is far away from that resonant frequency, the drive on this mode is what's called stiff. So basically, this stops being a quantum variable in my coupling Hamiltonian. It instead becomes a number. And so it basically gives me a new controllable interaction strength, where basically the strength of the drive helps control the strength of this interaction. The frequency of the drive is fixed to be the sum of the difference between these two. And the phase of the drive is going to impart some phase on this hopping potential. So what you can think of, uh, of happening here, if we look at this three-body interaction, is that if A wants to hop from B, let's say, and it uh, has too much energy, it can give that energy to the C fold. And similarly, if we try to go the other way, now we need to give up some energy. So C, if you like, this third body in the interaction is there to sort of make up the same energy difference that stops this two-body interaction from happening if the two frequencies are different. So now, in this parametric version of this interaction, it doesn't matter what omega A are and omega B are relative to each other. They can be anywhere you want. As long as omega C is spanning that difference, as long as omega C is, is the drive of that C mode is chosen to be both off resonance and sort of spanning the difference in energies between them, then these two modes, which are at very different frequencies, will exchange energy as if they're at the same frequency. And the other key piece here is that they will do this with this funny uh, complex G, where basically the phase of exchange is going to be set by the phase of the, in, in my case, microwave drive that's driving this C mode. Okay, this is an exchange interaction. We'll come back to it later. Um, so in my case, A, B, and C are all made out of the same stuff. Uh, if I want to write a Hamiltonian, it has to be quantum. It doesn't really matter if it's a quantum harmonic oscillator. It doesn't really matter if it's a big harmonic oscillator or a small one. Maybe I should ask you what you mean by macroscopic. Uh, yeah, there are some scenarios in which basically um, the C mode, let's say, could be in a thermal state. And there are some other... Um, I, I meant actually a coherent state, maybe, but... Okay, but, I, you know, the, it's not in a quantum state. Right. It's hot. Yeah. Uh, so a highly excited state would... Sure. But, but it doesn't have to be, is the... Uh, well, you... I mean, in my case, these are all microwave resonators, as you'll eventually okay. see. Okay, okay. All the same kind of states. Mm -hmm. In, like, an optomechanical system, where the A and B modes may be at optical frequencies, and the C mode may be at mechanical frequencies, where it is in, in a very highly excited state. There are certain other rules there, basically, about how fast that state changes compared to how fast photons move through it. Mm -hmm. And actually, Ash is the man to talk to about that. Uh, oh, that, 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 yeah, that's right. Uh, so you're driving it. If it has an occupancy just because of temperature, then it's really so that the drive must have a well determined phase, yeah. amplitude, and frequency. Okay. If the state itself has some highly excited state, but it's not changing fast, so that if it's exchanging you know, with the environment at a slow rate, then you can still get away with it. I think that's, Ash says it's okay. All right. So n um, this is not that transformation. This is just saying that it is so far off resonance that the photons don't actually stay in the resonator any reasonable amount of time. Even in that framework, if you... If the intensity of one mode is very high, then that can be treated as C number. Otherwise, it has to be treated as operator. Uh, I mean, yes. Uh, the, I mean, this thing tends to be driven very hard. I guess, um, um, I guess I haven't thought a lot carefully about that distinction. Because we, we do tend to drive it very, very hard. I'm not sure exactly where a soft driving of that thing would break down.
But um, in general, because you're driving it very far detuned, you do have to drive it with a very high amplitude to get any reasonable C term in your in your system. Okay. So, yeah. You are essentially trying to enhance the value of G. Uh, that's the aim. Yeah, here. That, that's one way to think of it. Is that if I took these two systems and I moved them apart, right? They no longer really exchange. So I'm trying to pump it back up. Right, right. But but part of it, uh, you know, the important part of it is not just to have a bigger G to overcome detuning. It's okay. just to add this third body to the system. Okay. So that I can have the equivalent of direct exchange. Okay. Even though they're far apart in frequency. And the G is like 100 or 200, 100 megahertz or something uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, like the omegas are like gigahertz and G is still in megahertz, right? Like 100 megahertz or uh, something. G will tend to be, yeah, oh yeah, G will be smaller than the omegas of the system. It will right. tend to be comparable to the kappas of the system. Okay. okay. This three body G here can be very small, like kilohertz. And then I can pump it up to be, you know, tens of megahertz or something okay, okay. by the addition of this third uh, pump wave. Okay, okay, okay. It is true that, you know, if you think about direct exchange of qubits, these tend to be natural Gs, two-body Gs that are big. This is a three-body G that's going to tend to naturally be smaller, and then I pump it back up. Okay, good. So now this is all perfectly quantum. The most correct way to proceed from here would be to add in the losses and the drives of the system explicitly and to do the stochastic master equation. That's pretty ugly, uh, and we don't really need it to capture some of the basic ideas that we're doing here. So what I'm going to do is basically say, here's the system, it's full Hamiltonian. And I'm going to change this coupling term. Look very carefully here. You'll see here now it's A dagger, B dagger, C plus A, B, C dagger. This, this is a slightly different three-body coupling. It's going to tend to try to create pairs of photons in A and B at the cost of a photon in C. Okay, so instead of directly exchanging them, it's going to create them in pairs and annihilate them in pairs. And this is going to turn out to be the interaction that leads to phase-preserving amplifying in my system. And you can sort of think here in frequency space, what I've got is here's omega A at some frequency, C at some frequency, B. And as long as this pump is far away in this particular case from C, as long as this distance is large compared to the bandwidth, again, this thing becomes stiff. It becomes a uh, number in my equations of motions and just something that I'm going to control these other two modes. You can go back and use this third mode in, as a real quantum mode. We, we do that in the most advanced experiments. Uh, and I'll talk about that in my research talk, which is Monday, I think. But for now, we're just going to sacrifice mode C and not worry about it anymore. Yeah, again, it's because I don't want its fluctuations to be part of the dynamic. I want it to just be a way to enhance my coupling and not uh, a real quantum variable whose fluctuations will basically imprint, for instance, fluctuations on my output. That would be the, the bad scenario. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take this dynamics here, and what we're going to basically do now is to look at the master equation. So here in particular, if I look at the evolution of this A operator in the system, I have this usual Hamiltonian evolution part, I have a dissipation part, and I have a drive part. And similarly, so this gives me this equation here for mode A. And you'll notice here that the parametric coupling here is going to give me this C-mediated coupling to mode B. And similarly, mode B here is going to have its own equations of motion with the C-mediated coupling back to mode A. And to make life simple, I'm going to consider that I've got a parametric drive on mode C, I've got a signal that's small on mode A, and mode B, I'm not going to drive at all. Okay, so the only drives on this circuit are the one parametric drive and the one signal that's incident on mode A. Of course, could, could turn the things around and do the same thing of driving mode B and not mode A. And, and you can also drive both at the same time, but then you get some weird complex nonlinearity of the system. And at this point, I'm going to stop being quantum mechanical. So now A and B, instead of becoming operators, are just going to become complex semi-classical variables. Okay? So this is going to be some sort of Langevin equi uh, equation type approach, where now I've relaxed my, my constraints on these things, and A and T are going to, B are going to tend to have complex values, but just be dynamical uh, variables in this equation, but not quantum operators. And then the next thing I'm going to tend to, I want to do is to go from the time domain to the Fourier domain, and I'm going to keep massaging my variables. So now I'm going to consider the fact that I may not be driving the A mode on resonance. I'm instead going to drive it at some frequency omega 1, which is omega A plus some small detuning delta, where delta will tend to be 
small compared to the bandwidth of the system, kappa. And then uh, I'm going to cleverly choose that the, the B mode, I'm going to look at this other frequency, omega B, uh, sorry, 2, which is omega B minus delta. And the reason I do that is basically when I Fourier transform this, this first equation, you see that all of these terms are terms either driving or responding at omega 1. Except for this one funny parametric coupling term here, where I see that I've got a B dagger of omega 2 times C. And remember, C in this case is going to be oscillating at the sum frequency of omega 1 plus omega 2. So the combination of this dagger and this C here are basically going to take these B oscillations and, uh, B, yeah, B oscillations and couple them into mode A as if they're at the same frequency. And to get the math to work out right, you see that if one of the signals is detuned by plus delta, then the oscillations in the other mode will be at minus delta. And this is all to satisfy this uh, idea that the sum of the two A and B photons that I create in the process must add up to omega C. So if one is positively detuned, the other one must be negatively detuned to maintain the sum. Okay, so I have these set of equations here. I've done the Fourier transform of them. And then basically I can just simplify the variables. I can take out omega A and omega B. And, and I get these nicer set of equations down here. Or I've taken one more uh, simplification, which is that I'm not really interested in what's going on inside the modes directly. This is an amplifier. I really care about what I do with an incident wave and what comes out of the two ports of this device. So here I have to use input-output theory and say, okay, here are the two stationary modes with circulating power inside them, but I've connected them to two transmission lines to give them these uh, damping rates kappa A and kappa B. And on A I've got an input wave and an output wave coupling to A by this input-output equation so that A in plus A out is equal to root kappa A. On the other side I would have a similar equation except I've agreed I'm not going to drive B. So now B, you see, is just going to directly be linked to B out. And then what I do when I simplify these equations is I, is I can kind of give you two what microwave engineers would call scattering parameters, which is to give a, a, a dimensionless coefficient saying, how much A out do I get for how much A in? I'm going to call that alpha. And beta is going to be how much B out do I get for how much A in? The only trick here compared to a normal microwave engineer is that these are at the same frequency but through this parametric coupling, the B out is going to be uh, centered on omega B, whereas the A in is centered on omega A. So you can kind of think of this as a process by where you enter mode A at omega A, you come out mode B at omega B, uh, but the parametric drive makes it as if these two things are sort of directly coupled at the same frequency. Okay, questions on that? It turns out you can take these equations and turn them around and solve for these scattering coefficients a and b, which will describe the amplifier. For instance, the mod alpha squared, which is the gain of the amplifier, how much uh, power comes out of mode a for power in mode b, has this sort of nice form here. It sort of looks like a Lorentzian, except it flattens out to a reflection gain of one off resonance. And basically now, for a given g and kappa a and kappa b, I can put c around to get whatever gain I want. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. So if I want a 20 dB amplifier in this case, where these guys have all been set conveniently to 50 megahertz, then the C coefficient here, C squared, is just going to be 0.36. And if I look at the overall behavior of the device here, if I think of these as ports now, A and B as the input and output ports, sort of abstracting away the modes inside them, then what's going to happen here is that this gain is like 20 dB. So any signal that's incident on A will be reflected with a gain, in this case, root G of 10. It'll also be transmitted with this frequency conversion. And if I drive instead mode B, the same thing will happen in reverse. Basically, B will be amplified back into B, also transmitted into A. And one of the interesting things here is that the, you have these um, phase shifts that are complex conjugates of each other that are also determined by the phase of the microwave pump. So the phase of the microwave pump doesn't really matter in terms of the raw gain of the device. That's set by the frequency and the amplitude. But this, this sort of phase here that we can use to create non-reciprocal devices uh, is created sort of automatically. If you like, the system has a, a time, a clock, that is set by the microwave pump itself. And so I can basically control that direction as I choose. Uh, sorry. Actually, I'm still a bit confused about this. Uh, this. What is the expectation value of A squared? What is the number? What is the value of expectation value of A squared? Typical num value of expectation value of A squared? 
expectation of a squared when I'm, when I'm not driving the system. When, when you're driving, when, when c squared is 0.36. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. E like slides. Yeah, because I mean, the, the, uh, I, I would expect... So this is a semi-classical derivation. There's nothing in here about the fluctuations in A. This is just to look at the average power gain of the system. To, to really get back to Cave's theorem and to think quantum mechanically, you have to be a bit more careful. Right, but I mean, for such small value of expectation of C squared, I wouldn't expect uh, this approximation to oh, work, oh, right? Yeah, so I have, uh, my students are not theorists, they're experimentalists, so they just, they knew they wanted these things to be equal, so they set them all to be equal. In a real experiment, this number would be something like 10 kilohertz, and C would be correspondingly larger. Okay, it's larger in the sense, what is the number? Like, uh, oh, whatever, it's, the, the product is what matters. So, okay. you know, if it'll be the hundred or thousand times bigger that this thing is smaller. Oh. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, ha I have to admit here, um, this is an audience of mostly theorists. Uh, this is like, it's great, it's like exam time. Uh, in a real device, this is some few kilohertz. When you're plotting in Mathematica, they just set these things all to be the same. And this is Mathematica. This is not some stochastic master equation simulation. And usually it's not a problem to get the G to be small and the C to be big. Usually it's impossible to physically make it big enough to be, you know, to get, uh, to get me into this difficulty I've gotten in by having them plug in silly numbers. You good now? But that's the fluctuations of the C mode. A and B, how much noise in the system is not addressed here by this, this semi-classical picture. I'm just setting up a scattering matrix, sort of treating the device as a classical object. And, and we'll get to why that might be quantum limited in a few slides. Okay, any more questions before we move on? Okay, great. So now the next crucial thing about this amplifier, okay, again, multiply this by a thousand if you like, uh, is that the amplifier has a divergent gain versus pump power profile. That is, if I look at the gain at zero detuning, this expression simplifies to something like one plus rho squared, over one minus rho squared, where rho squared is this, this ratio of the G's and the kappas and the pump in the system. And when this reaches one, obviously it diverges. So this amplifier is naturally divergent. As experimentalists, what that means is that you have to control the pump power extremely finely. Basically, if, as you climb up the slope, eventually you'll reach a point where the smallest step on your generator's 0.01 dB is too big to move, let's say, between 32 and 33 dB. So this amplifier is very sensitive to fluctuations in this power. That's going to be a practical difficulty. The other interesting thing here from a theory perspective is that these classical solutions say that the gain rises and then falls again. Uh, uh, in the laboratory, and I guess in a more sophisticated theoretical analysis, we see that this lower branch tends to be stable. This upper branch tends to be associated with some sort of odd other nonlinear processes. The device, for instance, can decide to sort of become a laser on its own and produce its own sort of slowly drifting output, even though you're not putting it in input. So that's one of the caveats here is that this equation will happily solve itself for you, but in practice, we need to stay on the lower side of this divergent gain. The amplifier itself, its bandwidth versus gain and mode bandwidth is sort of puny. So the dynamical bandwidth here, 2 pi b of the system, is going to be given by the gain divided by the bandwidth that I started with. So if you like, this uh, system has a fixed gain bandwidth product given by the did I do that upside down? I did, sorry. Invert this. So this, this uh, has a fixed gain with product, which is equal to the linear bandwidth of the modes that you start with. So if you want to have a gain of 10 and 100 megahertz of bandwidth, you need to start with a gigahertz of initial bandwidth so that when you lose that factor of 10, you can still have a reasonable gain. And it's very easy to, in the system by slowly changing the parametric drive strength to turn the gain up to whatever value you need for your experiment, but you're going to do so at the direct cost of the bandwidth of the system. So I could operate it at 45 dB and have tons and tons of gain, but my bandwidth is going to be some few kilohertz. So this is a dynamical trade-off that you can make, but it's sort of, it's a tough one. Okay, so putting what I've told you together so far, there are some important practical limitations of the amplifier. The first one is, it's an amplifier, but it amplifies in reflection. Um, this is kind of a problem. If you have your delicate quantum system here that's emitting some signals that you want to amplify and detect, well, what you're actually doing is amplifying the signal and sending it right back into the system that you started with. So whenever you see um, experimental schematics of these devices, they're always used with external, what are called circulators, basically external objects that can route the incoming signal and the outgoing signal into different ports 
stop this from coming right back and interacting and back acting on the system of measurement. The other problem is this narrow bandwidth, which here I have written correctly. It has this narrow bandwidth, and this bandwidth gets worse the higher the gain. The third part, and I'm not going to really sort of focus on this too heavily in the tutorial because I don't feel that we really understand the answers here very well, is this idea of gain saturation, or it's sometimes called P minus 1 dB, or basically just the gain falls as you input too much signal power. So this is real experimental data here. So on this vertical axis is the gain. On this horizontal axis is the, the cold signal input power in, in, in units of dBm. And so what you see here is that if you set the amplifier at the very small signal limit to 20 dB of gain, and you steadily increase it, then at first it's what we call unsaturated. This gain is not a function of power. But eventually it will typically fall. And this is true of most microwave amplifiers. Basically, uh, in this case what's happening, the simple theory at least, is that there's this thing called pump depletion, which is to say the gain is itself fixed by how hard I'm pumping the system parametrically. But the parametric drive also provides the power that I use to amplify my signals. So I put in signals, they pull power out of the pump, the pump power falls, and therefore my gain falls. Right? So signal power increases, it requires more pump photons, the gain falls. And therefore, uh, the, the, the harder I need to pump, the better this P minus 1 dB power should be. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't tend to be true in real life. And basically, um, I at least allege that we don't understand well all the causes of the saturation. This, this phenomenon here called pump depletion should exist. And there should be some amplifiers if you sort of twist the parameters around where maybe this is the dominant cause. But when we build these amplifiers in the laboratory and we vary the schematics of them and we vary the parameters in the system, basically we, we run into other limits well before this pump depletion would be predicted to, to take over. So this is an, sort of an open problem for the device. Uh, it's not really been solved yet. This is sort of an area of active research. OK, um, so now that I've kicked the parametric amplifiers around a little, uh, I want to emphasize here, though, they have one sovereign virtue, which is that they are quantum limited. And they're sort of naturally quantum limited. Because if you think about what they do, is they take these two microwave inputs, and they sort of amplify them jointly into the output. And so if I think about this B unused mode here as an empty or idle mode in the language of caves, if this has a half photons of quantum fluctuation because it's in a coherent state, and this has a half photon of fluctuations because it's in a vacuum state, then the sum at the output is basically going to just add those two together. It's just going to take this half photon and that half photon, produce an output state that nicely satisfies cave theorem, and not only that, I can sort of point to whether physical origin is of the added noise. It's just the quantum fluctuations of this idler unused mode. So I kind of know the physical origin of the added noise of the system. But this idea that it just sort of combines the two modes together and jointly amplifies them uh, doesn't really rely on them being in a quantum state. Right? If they each get 4 Kelvin of noise, if they're each in a thermal state, then it would just do the same thing. It would just kind of double the noise. So this amplifier will always sort of naturally degrade the system of your S, the SNR of your system by a factor of two. It's just in the quantum limit that this factor of two becomes special. So you will not see a lot of parametric amplifiers in sort of uh, the classical world because there, there are other schemes and other tricks that can beat this factor of two. You can have systems who do, do much better than this. But when you come down to the quantum world, when you build your amplifier out of quantum pieces, this becomes very natural and sort of uh, nicely understandable in terms of why this amplifier should be quantum limit. Uh, if you ask how we test this, you know, if you don't believe me, uh, I'm going to show you this sort of cryptic looking diagram here. Basically, these are those sort of Gaussian balls I've been talking about all along. And by, in this case, using qubits, we can go back and track this system and very nicely calibrate basically how wide is this thing versus how far these guys are separated and, and back out that these systems are very near the quantum limit. They're not quite there yet. The best systems are sort of within a factor of two. So instead of adding this extra half, add something like an extra one. All right? Great. So now uh, VJ is going to talk tomorrow about the phase sensitive amplifier. And I wanted to sort of set the stage for that a little in terms of this, this, this semi-classical derivation that I've done. Here the system is going to have, in this case, two modes. It's going to have the A mode and the sacrificial C mode. This is not how VJ actually does it. He does it in a slightly... Uh, tougher way uh, with four modes, but imagine you have this three-mode coupling, which we do have in my laboratory. 
then you see here that it's like the things that used to be A dagger B dagger and AB. Oh, in fact, man, typos. That should be an A. Uh, the, the A mode here and the B mode here have just sort of been replaced by two A's. And if I limit myself to operating at a slight detuning from the center of the mode, if I only look at signals that come in delta detuned from mode A, then I could replace the A and B with sort of an operator A upper and A lower. And my similar dynamical equations will basically be coupled together. So here, here's my phase preserving amplifier. You see here I'm detuned by plus delta. What the phase preserving amplifier does is couple at the same frequency to the output, but also couple at omega B minus delta. So here's what we call the signal copy. Here's what we call the idler copy of this input signal. And it similarly couples noise from this frequency to those same two frequencies. Uh, whereas here, in the phase sensitive case, there is only mode A, but the same idea of sort of an, a signal copy at the same frequency and an idler copy at this, uh, this other frequency that's minus delta detuned still holds up. So you can basically go back to those equations of motion and get very similar ones. And if you only treat signals in the upper sideband, you can call that the signal mode, sort of this half of the oscillator. And then the idler mode will be the, the, the lower half of the resonator. And then you'll basically get back to the same scenario. So even if the amplifier is this thing we call phase sensitive, if you send in the signal detuned from the center, asymmetrically here, if it's off on one side, you'll get back to this idea of phase preserving amplification. Phase sensitive amplification is only when you take the delta exactly to zero. And then these two processes now directly lie on top of each other in frequency, and they directly interfere. And, and, and VJ is going to show a lot of data about that tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, yes. Uh, just to show you basically that, that this really happens in real life, I have some data here. So again, at zero offset frequencies, the signal and the idler tones interfere. The way they interfere, that is the phase of their combination, is set by the phase of the parametric drive that powers the system. So basically what will happen is that one quadrature input will interfere constructively and be amplified. The other quadrature inputs, that is, you know, for instance, a signal into I would be amplified, a signal into Q would be deamplified. So here's experimental evidence of the two scenarios here, a phase preserving gain, phase sensitive gain in the same device. So this is just uh, me measuring the, the output power of the system. So this is amplified noise everywhere here, except where I've added a small signal input at this positive delta. And you see now here at the same mode, symmetrically detuned, I get another copy of my signal. One of these is technically G and the other is G minus one. If I zoomed in very closely, I'd see that one is slightly shorter than the other. But basically you can think of these in the high gain limit as two identical copies of this signal. What I've done here in this second experiment is to detune very precisely right to the center frequency of the resonator. And now I've left the signal phase alone and I've varied the phase of my microwave pump here. So the horizontal axis is the phase of the microwave pump. The vertical axis is the integrated power that I detect. And what you see here is that this thing rolls as a function of this pump phase. So what's basically going on is that the amplifier amplifies only one quadrature, and by changing the pump for a fixed input signal, I can pick whether I'm amplifying, or sort of neutral here, this is zero gain, or de-amplifying this particular signal. Uh, you can also do this experiment the other way around, which is to basically fix the gain of the microwave pump and to vary the signal phase of the input, and you'll get a very similar looking graph here. And again, this will be the focus on Vijay's talk uh, tomorrow. So I think he's going to give you some other uh, ways to understand that then. Yeah, the pump phase is hidden. So here in this derivation, just for ease, I've set it to zero. But there would be a phase factor right here that would show up on these two, uh, where are they? These two parametric coupling terms right there. So now um, the, the next thing to confront is that, so we've talked about phase sensitive amplifiers, we've talked about phase preserving amplifiers, and there's a lot of lingo that people use to sort of confuse the issue here. So I'm just, this slide, I guess, uh, if you go back and read this later, maybe it's more useful to you. Um, and optical frequencies, they tend to call phase preserving detection heterodyne detection. Phase sensitive detection tends to be called homodyne detection. And now, if you nature of the coupling, if it's three waves, 
that is, you know, omega A plus omega B equals omega C. There are three waves in the problem. That tends to be called uh, uh, non-degenerate, and four wave tends to be called degenerate. So another part of this graph is that a one-mode amplifier is also degenerate because it amplifies into itself twice, as we've discussed about. A two-mode amplifier here is called non-degenerate. So a two-mode amplifier with a three-wave coupling has no degeneracies. The pump is not degenerate, the signal is not degenerate, so they call this a non-degenerate amplifier in, the, in some of the older literature, or a, a non-degenerate phase-preserving amplifier. If you have a one-mode system and a three-wave coupling, that is that the signal is degenerate, but the, uh, and I'll, I'll show you down here how, maybe how to make a little bit more sense of that, but the pump is not, that's called singly degenerate, and again, four-wave here is called doubling degenerate. And these are all terms that I try to avoid using, uh, but they're in the literature, so I thought I would spell them out for you. I think a much more useful way to do this is just to directly specify the parametric amplification interaction that's driving the system. So here, for instance, here's the phase sensitive one we started with, A dagger, B dagger, C. So the fact that there are two different modes here are what is going to make it, you know, uh, obviously phase preserving because it doesn't give the opportunity for the two signals to interfere with each other. Here's the same idea, uh, but the phase sensitive version. If you look at this one here, it basically shares the first two terms with this guy, but now where the pump should be are two more A's. So in this particular scenario, what you can have here is a creation of two signal photons by the destruction of two other photons that are pumped into the same mode. So this is a weird amplifier where you pump it on resonance really hard and it tends to take pairs of pump photons to produce pairs of amplified signal photons. Or if you want to make your life a little simpler, you can apply these as two symmetrically detuned pumps from the system whose sum adds up. But this is a four-wave amplifier here. And, and once you basically have taken off the pump parts, you'll see that the, the coupling that's left in these two scenarios is identical. So the behavior, practically speaking, of the amplifier is going to be very similar modulo how you apply the pump to it to make it work. Whether it's a single pump at twice the frequency or a single pump in the same mode at that frequency. And just to complete the graph here where I don't have a name up here, you know, you could also have some phase preserving amplifier that is one with two different modes here, A and B, by a pair of pumps in the C mode. This is also, I think, a perfectly legitimate way to make a device, but I put the caveat here that I'm not aware of anyone who has built this or even especially why you'd want to, but if you were given this kind of device and someone said go off in the laboratory and make a parametric amplifier of it, we would know how to do it. We would just basically cut the C mode pump frequency in half and everything else I told you before would apply. So uh, some people are wrinkling their brows. This is all basically relying on the fact that these pump signals, uh, sorry, these pumps are stiff. They're off resonance, and except for this case right here. And I can really drop them out of the dynamics of the system. So as long as I'm providing the same energy, it doesn't matter if I do it one photon at a time or two photons at a time. Um, so I have a question. So for this one mode four wave coupling scenario, so what will be the application of it? Because it looks like your signal will have less photon than your incoming at the same energy or frequency. I hear you mean. Yeah. Uh, this is easy to make, it turns out, in superconducting circuits. It's a pain to operate, and it has some practical difficulties, and it, but I shouldn't trash it too much because all of VJ's results tomorrow are based on this particular kind of coupling. Right, so it's not you feel desirable compared to, let's say, this one from a Hamiltonian set of view. Mm -hmm. Really, the question is, how do you engineer this Hamiltonian and it turns out that this one is one of the easier ones to make. This is a natural current nonlinearity, which all of our Josephson junctions already have, so it's just sitting there ready to be used. This one either requires a, a more sophisticated circuit or some more sophisticated microwave engineering to couple the boats together in the right way. So, so these, uh, sorry, so in terms of historical, at least in the superconducting community, this is the easy one, this is the same one we use in the transmon qubit. Every junction has it very naturally, no effort. It's a device with one junction. This required a, uh, a ring of four junctions to really make nicely. So you can do it kind of okay with two and a flux pump. And this one, it turns out, requires something like four or eight junctions to make work naturally. So, you know, uh, at the level of extraction I'm talking about here, it's obvious that you wouldn't want these four-wave ones because they're just more of a pain. You'd want these three-wave guys here. But then the question becomes, how do you build them? And if you have some other system, optomechanics or, or, or you know, nonlinear capacitors of some kind, I don't know, 
then you know you can use all of these. These can all make parametric amplifiers. Maybe where you live is going to be determined by what's the natural Hamiltonian of your circuit and how much you have to twist it around to get these terms. And, and this is not the end of the story. Uh, sorry, just to jump ahead to help answer your question. What about that one? This turns out, this is, this is natural in my system and is a perfectly good phase sensitive amplifier. It's got that same first A dagger, A dagger pair, but now it's got C cubed. So in that case, I'm just going to pump at two thirds of the A frequency. And um, actually, one of the problems we have in our devices, and I'll talk about this in my, you know, my, my research talk on Monday, is that there's a lot of these terms floating around, especially when you have a system that's supposed to be symmetric, but you broke it by improper engineering. Your, your objects are not identical that you make it up out of. And so if you want to be glass half full, there's another way to make a parametric amplifier. If you want to be glass half empty, there's a landmine where if you accidentally satisfy this uh, term at the same time as you're satisfying some other term in your system, you basically have two competing parametric processes going on. And if, if you haven't picked them carefully, it's unlikely that they're going to interact in a positive way. So, uh, but if you're just students having crazy science Friday in the lab, we find more and more of these systems. And it turns out that if your system is not perfect, which means basically anything we build in the laboratory. And because these parametric drives allow you to pump up very weak couplings, you can just go hunting. You could write one on the chalkboard. And as long as it satisfies, you know, it's physical, I could probably go and hunt it up in my system and even use it to make a device. And that's actually, uh, so I won't talk about this, but we have a, a little paper that we're writing right now where we're using this one. It's a parasite in the device designed to do this one. But it's nice because it gives you phase sensitive and phase preserving amplifier in the same physical device by just moving the pump around. But uh, this is kind of a long winded answer to your question, but basically, I think your question was why do this? And the answer is because maybe it's convenient. But if you had a system with only this one, only this weird one, this fifth order coupling, and you called me and you said, Michael, can I make a parametric amplifier? I would say yes. And these days, I think if you give me any sort of one of these guys with an, you know, where they're not all, well, even when they, everything starts to look like a parametric amplifier if you sort of look at it hard enough and you get used enough to applying these principles. Okay. Um, and I just want to go back now to just touch briefly. So we've talked about phase sensitive amplifiers, phase preserving amplifiers. Uh, the situation can be even more confusing if you sort of add couplings that don't produce gain. So this is my original photon swap Hamiltonian, A dagger B plus AB dagger. It's the parametric version of it. So this is the one that's driven by coupling to mode C. So basically all I do is instead now pump at the, the difference frequency instead of the sum frequency. This produces an interesting quantum device. It's basically a photon frequency converter. So any signal incident on this guy, if I set it to the right drive coefficient, will be perfectly absorbed here, like in this experimental data, and instead transmitted over to the other port. So we call this uh, a converter. And this is another kind of parametric coupling. And there are a few others that are, I'm aware of in the literature and probably even more that people could identify that do something of interest. So this idea of parametric coupling, even though we tend to talk about it in the context of amplifiers, it exists in, you know, just as a way to produce coupling terms between modes that you want. And if you have other couplings that you want, uh, people like me would be happy to make parametric versions of them and, and hook them up for you. Asking the question, since this is a non-Hermitian uh, workshop, so is there a way you can make the coupling uh, not um, Hermitian conjugate each other? <laughs> uh, I, yes, there are theory proposals to basically build things that I would call like amplifier derived, where they try to have couplings that couple one way and not the same in reverse. Uh, I guess I'm a little naive as an experimentalist point of view. Everything I make is Hermitian. I would tend to couple it to loss and add parametric drive to make the effective Hamiltonian. So everything I know how to build is Hermitian, but of course we try to find dynamical behaviors that are very interesting. And this idea of non-reciprocity, so this is reciprocal, you see, it goes in one way and not the other. Every microwave engineer knows of a non-reciprocal version of this called the isolator, which is where you go one way through and the other way you just get absorbed. And we, we can build those in the laboratory. So I don't know if I want to claim that they're non-Hermitian devices, but certainly they have the equivalent of a classical scattering matrix where the light goes one way and the other way it goes completely somewhere different. And we can, we, um, so to go back now to this idea, um, 
one of the shortcomings I told you about the amplifier is it amplifies in reflection. And even if it amplified in tr transmission, if it also amplifies in the other direction, it will tend to shoot amplified quantum noise right back into my device. So here I really want a, a device whose total behavior is, in this sense, you know, not bidirectional, that's built sort of in a, in a stranger way. And sort of we can do that, and here's some theory and some experimental applications, where we're now going to take, for instance, three modes or four modes and turn on all sorts of parametric couplings between, let's say, all of them. So in three modes, it would be three different parametric couplings coupling each arm of this triangle. In four modes, there are six parametric couplings. And if you do that, you can get systems whose effective behavior are really weird. So amplifiers that amplify one way and shunt signals other ways. You can build circulators. You can build four-port circulators. Uh, we don't use the same language that's being used here in this conference, but you know, in terms of microwave engineering, classical analogs, we're very interested in that, as well as things like breaking this gain bandwidth product uh, limitation and just in general how to build these amplifiers to be more quantum and more practical, or maybe even separately optimizing for one or either. Just one question about this diagram. So can you uh, make uh, like some sort of a uh, uh, artificial gauge field, like you know, uh, you have ABC, like like John Martini's experiments recently, where you have like some uh, yes. complex. Uh, what a physicist calls an artificial gauge field, a microwave engineer calls a circulator. So a circulator's got a ferrite medium with an actual B field in it to break the time reversal symmetry and send the light the three ways. So this paper here is an experimental realization of such a circulator. Again, the underlying mechanism, as I showed you, are these phase factors in these parametric couplings. So they have sort of already a broken symmetry. If you set all the phases to zero, nothing interesting happens. But because they have these, these phases that oppose each other in sign, you can make loops here, for instance, where you constructively interfere one way and destructively interfere the other way. And in the four mode devices, there's actually, you know, many subloops, many triangular subloops that can make even more complex interference. So we definitely do that. Um, and you know, so and here are some theory proposals. The the I guess the only challenge is really one of language, because again, we tend to derive our language either from from quantum optics or even more likely from microwave engineering. So yes, but we don't tend to call it that. Uh, so there are other examples of there's like a quantum hall version of that recently from Australia. I know there's theory for that by uh, Di Vincenzo. And again, it's not a parametric version of this, but it's the same idea of basically setting up these parametric couplings around a loop via the quantum Hall effect that kind of have that same thing. There, the actual breaking of symmetry is a real magnetic field, but I think they have ideas of different versions of the quantum Hall effect to take the, the real magnetic field away from it. And there are other theory proposals, like people like Florian Markhart, to really think about an array of these guys, or, or, or again, Ash, where like you have a 2D lattice of harmonic oscillators or spins and try to do more interesting sort of topological couplings there. In this particular set of talks you're getting from me and VJ, we tend to make amplifiers. So we don't tend to have systems that contain their light. We tend to have systems that couple out their light. But the underlying physics is all the same. OK. Uh, so these amplifiers are quantum objects, I have alleged to you. And I've told you that their, their performance is quantum limited. The other way of saying that is that their output states are quantum light, and they tend to be interesting forms of squeezed quantum light. So the phase-sensitive amplifier that VJ is going to tell you about tomorrow, if you feed it a vacuum state or a uh, coherent state as the input, what you're going to get out is a one-mode squeeze state of quantum light at the output. So if you don't want to use the amplifier as an amplifier, you can instead use it as a light source. You could basically use it on the front end of your system as a way to produce one mode squeeze light. So that begs the question of what's the phase preserving amplifier? The phase preserving amplifier's output is a thing called two mode squeezed light. So if you look at either port by itself, it looks like a big amplified thermal state. But if you measure, let's say, one copy of the signal, then the other copy of the signal will give you the exact same answer with an imprecision that is basically the width of a coherent state. So when you measure this state, that state is in a coherent state whose center is given by the answer. So this is called two-mode squeezed light. Another way to say that is if you look at these funny correlation quadratures here, even though you can't see it from looking at the regular quadratures of the system, there are certain special quadratures hidden inside here that are very tightly correlated in the same way one-mode squeezed light would be. Okay? And so we're actually experiments in my laboratory 
where we feed vacuum into these guys, produce two modes, squeeze light on the output. And because it's producing quantum light on the output from quantum light on the input, you know, really the right way to say is that amplification is not sort of a process. Like, you're used to thinking of an amplified signal being the end of the story. A real quantum-limited perfect amplifier is doing a unitary transformation on some input light. And, you know, one test of unitarity is that I could just undo it. And so you could have coherent states here, amplify them some big two-mode squeeze state. If you amplify them with the, the wrong phase, you just get double amplification. But if you amplify with a phase chosen to undo, you can basically go back to uncorrelated vacuum in these two experiments. And this has both been done in France and this experiment we're doing in my laboratory here. So here's an example of data from this kind of system here where both amplifiers are set to have 10 dB of gain. And basically, if you uh, set them to the same phase, they get 26 dB of total gain. And if you now roll the phase to be 180 degrees, they will basically uh, not only sort of uh, not work, they will kind of go back to undo each other. So you should go back to zero net gain. And the system's not perfect, it doesn't work perfectly, but if you look here in the noise of the system, here is just the noise of the output amplifier alone. If you add this sort of squeezed light to its input, you can actually squeeze this light down to below this floor, which is showing, uh, not perfectly, but showing that in these amplifiers we actually make, they produce really some kind of muddy version of a unitary transformation of this light that we can then choose to undo, again, in a muddy way later. But as these amplifiers become more perfect, Really, they're going to transform light, but they're not going to stop the story. They're not going to stop you from doing anything else you want to do to that light later, including undoing that choice. So this really begs the question in these systems of, of, of when do we measure? Because the amplifier itself, so here's my amplifier, we call it the JPC, you'll hear more about it from me on Friday. Uh, it's not measuring, at least in the ideal version. Practically in the laboratory, we have some qubit-like object over here, that in, interacts with the light, this light passes the JPC, there's some losses. So some part of the measurement collapse of this quantumness of the light happens there. The amplifier is not perfect, so some more happens in the amplifier itself. Now, certainly when you have this big amplified state, it's very easy to lose one or two photons worth of energy. So measurement tends to happen very rapidly here after the amplifier. And certainly by the time it gets to my noisy classical amplifier here, it's done. But the experiments that Vijay and I are going to tell you about, the really interesting and neat part is to see that we're maintaining the quantum coherence of the light, not just inside the cavity where it originates, but really throughout the system and even through the, these sort of objects that we're making and calling amplifiers. Okay, so just the, the story so far, I think, yeah, more or less on schedule. The story so far is to say, okay, we want to talk about generating quantum light, in our case, entangling it with qubits, and then measuring that light using parametric amplifiers. These amplifiers are great because they're quantum limited. They're the right kind of transformation for amplifying coherent pulses of light. Uh, the second thing we've talked about is that the act of amplification is quantum. This measurement occurs really when information is lost. And an ideal amplifier won't lose anything, so it won't measure. It'll just do some transformation, uh, which means that the amplifier itself has an output, which is an interesting state of quantum light. And we're going to try to uh, show you all of this over the next two days of experimental data. But first, I want to start setting the stage, stage a little bit for VJ making his life a little easier by talking about now specifically superconducting circuits. Okay, just real fast, um, just so everybody agrees on the terminology. So we, when we talk, try to talk about a qubit, we talk about a two-level quantum system. It needs to be prepared in some well-known initial state, you know, some arbitrary superposition, alpha G plus beta E. And for experimentalists, the two things that eat our lunch are the energy relaxation time, that is the time it takes to fall back to the ground state, T1, and T2, which is the time for some coherent superposition to become incoherent. And the name of the game in the, the nice experiments of Vijay are going to show you is to, for instance, take two such qubits and generate Bell states or entangled states between them. The dream of quantum information is basically to take such systems well-behaved quantum systems, qubits, they, in your system they might be a photon, an electron, whatever. And we need to individually control them, we need to couple them together, and we need to individually and efficiently sense them. We need to be able to sense them in a single shot without destroying the state. So our amplifiers come in on these bottom two things here. So any quantum machine is just basically something where you put all this stuff together. 
The most interesting ones are the sort of quantum computers that either do simulation. This is a very hot topic right now, sort of a la Feynman. Uh, everybody likes when you can perform algorithms which are hard for classical computers. So there, this is Peter Shor. Shor's factoring algorithm remains sort of a bedrock of the field. And uh, you know, for most of us, we really hope that we can come up with something even yet cooler than these two things here. The superconducting circuits, they're really microwave circuits. So, so this is one of my devices. You see here, these are microwave SMA inputs. We typically have silicon chips. We fab stuff in superconducting aluminum on top of them. And the, the fabrication goes from the sort of centimeter scale here, that's the size of this chip, down to the few hundred nanometer scale here. You maybe have heard about 3D qubits. So these horizontal and vertical lines are lambda over two resonators on a chip. They don't tend to have the best coherence times. The best coherence times in our systems are when you take a hollow block of aluminum and can find your photon there. So this would be called a 3D cavity. This would be called, I guess, either a 2D or a 1D cavity, depending on how you're counting. And these top and bottom pictures here show what powers everything. If you have a qubit, we make a very small Josephson junction. If you have an amplifier, we make a very large one. But in all of our systems, all the nonlinearity that makes all the Hamiltonian physics fun is just this, this Josephson junction right here. And all it is is two superconducting electrodes separated by a nanometer-ish oxide barrier. And so the current that flows in this junction in response to some phase difference in the superconducting order parameters across the junction is sinusoidal with some maximum current I naught. There is a whole other branch of physics where you basically switch these junctions. You, you exceed this critical current and you go into the voltage state. In all of our quantum stuff, we're going to always stay well below this critical current. So they're always going to stay in the superconducting state. And here we think of them as nonlinear inductors. And they're, of course, shunted by also a capacitance because if you look at this thing here of two metal plates with an insulator, there's also some capacitance here. And we tend to fabricate them by uh, shadow evaporation so that we make one layer, we oxidize it. And if you look closely, you can see that this other upper layer is like laid across it. Uh, if we want to make a qubit, we just take a bare junction, float, you know, which floating in space would be a very anharmonic os oscillator because of this sinusoidal current phase relation. And we just make it boring. We damp it down. We put a big capacitor on it until we squash almost all the anharmonicity. I end up in a system with, let's say, a 5 gigahertz GDE transition and an E to F transition that's a few hundred megahertz lower than it. So technically, this is not a qubit. But if we promise to never drive at this frequency here, and the temperature is not too hot, we'll be confined to these bottom two states, which we identify as our qubit. This is a very simple system. Its primary virtue is that it's not sensitive to charge noise. Because it turns out charge fluctuations on any substrate that we build on are one of the sort of uh, evil bugbears that give us trouble. So this system doesn't care if the charge on the, the, the wafer that it's sitting reconfigures itself. And this is one of the, the virtues. So this thing goes by the name transmon. There are other kinds of qubits. I think this by far is the most popular one these days because it is very simple, it is very robust. And as you can see, it's just putting a capacitor, which is not so hard to make across a junction, so it's definitely the simplest. Uh, these days, the long-lived ones tend to live on sapphire, so it's a little hard to see here. There's a sapphire chip. That little smudge-looking thing is my transmon. We tend to shove these things into 3D cavities, so here's the sapphire chip sitting edge-on inside this cavity. And you know, the cavities are something like 7 to 10 gigahertz. The transmon tend to be about 5-ish gigahertz. Uh, in my laboratory, they're not great. They're 30 to 50 microsecond transmons. I think the best these days can exceed 100 microseconds. The amplifiers, and we'll really go into this in detail on Friday, but just to tease a little, uh, that we build in my laboratory are basically two microwave modes. So if you look here, this is a lambda over 2 resonator. This is a lambda over 2 resonator. They end in these coupling capacitors, which are too small to see on this diagram. And in the middle here is an array of Josephson junctions. And so we went, you went back to this question of why do I have the particular Hamiltonian uh, that I do, the particular parametric coupling. This particular guy here is designed to produce this A dagger, B dagger, C coupling. So this is what determines the interaction between the modes. These are just the modes themselves. I couple the microwave light in and out. I pump the system, and we make a parametric amplifier. We put them in a nice box to shield them from the outside world. And uh, you know, these things are kind of a commodity item. You can actually buy them now from some of the quantum computing startups. And we'll talk a lot more about them on Friday. I think the thing that's in the news and that maybe you, know, maybe you see when you think of a superconducting qubit uh, computer is something more like this. 
This is IBM's fake quantum computer uh, that they apparently take on the road. And so here you can see, you know, this is where all my superconducting circuits are going to live, my parametric amplifiers. All of this stuff, which looks so awesome, is actually just circulators to provide this input-output routing that I talked about before. So the majority of this picture, I feel like, is generating business for people like me who need to take this functionality, move it into the quantum regime, and move it inside the box here. Okay? And so we come to the end of our time. I just wanted to tease. So when you ask someone like Vijay and I what they do in the laboratory all day, it's basically something like this. So this is the experiment that's going to repeat itself over and over again for the next two tutorials. So here's our stationary qubit, my transmon. He's well protected. He lives in a box. He has long coherence times. The name of the game here is to take our microwave light. He's the flying, see he's flying because he's got a cape, ancillary qubit. And there's some misused Shakespeare here. And the whole point is that we're going to interact them in such a way so that they're dispersively coupled. They become entangled but don't exchange energy. And, and we'll talk about how to do that tomorrow. And then here's our amplifier, our object that's going to read them out. And all we want to do is to consume this information and predict the state of the qubit. It turns out it's really hard. It keeps us busy pretty much all the time. And variations on this experiment are what we're going to be showing for the next few days. So I'll stop now and take any questions you have. Questions? Hello, I have a lot of questions, um, but maybe to begin with, I mean, the, the, the amplifying part, I'm imagining that you're, you're trying to amplify up a qubit to something that we can see, right? That's right. So the, there's Schrodinger cat states being formed in your, in your amplifier? Mm, the amplifier entangles two modes to make two modes squeeze light. It doesn't look like a Schrodinger cat. Uh, if you fed a Schrodinger cat into my amplifier, Mm -hmm. You would do very strange things to it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying that you feed one in. I'm assuming you're feeding in a, a qubit. But are, are you creating one at some point in the sense that you know, you're amplifying up this superposition? Right, okay. So if, if this is a real qubit, so this, this is the qubit I tend to, to care about. It's my transmon. His information doesn't, his inf information about him leaves, but his energy doesn't leave. If I think about this input, so calling him a qubit here, let's imagine he's a coherent state. Mm -hmm. So now at this point when they've dispersively interacted, now let's say you have a state like, where's some chalk? The total state of the system will be something like uh, psi equals alpha g, alpha g, that is whatever coherent state comes out, if it interacts with the qubit cavity system in the ground state, plus beta E alpha E. And if the coherent states are big enough that this overlap between the coherent states is basically zero, then I have made, some, it's not a cat state because they're each part, each head of the cat is entangled with a different qubit state. Mm -hmm. oh. But it is a, like, a, we can call it a bell state. Okay. Where one half of the bell state is a real qubit with two states, the other half of the bell state lives in this kind of cat space of continuous excitations in the cavity. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not a cat state because of this entanglement. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm going to do is to take this flying light, as you see, and kind of feed it into the wood chipper. It's going to be consumed. There's nothing going to be left of that qubit. All that's going to be left is a record of the back action on the, on the primary qubit. Right. So it's, it's a little sad that we create these beautiful flying qubits just to consume them. There are other ideas of a quantum computer where you sort of want all the qubits to be flying qubits, and there you would interact with some of them and consume them, leave the other ones in an interesting state. Mm -hmm. Here we tend to have this very asymmetric situation where we have very long-lived, well-protected qubits that are the sort of qubits that people talk about. The readout qubits are quantum states with two distinguishable states, so they like qubits, but we don't tend to, for instance, have full quantum control over them. They don't have long-term coherence. They just have to live long enough to impart to us their information as we consume them. But they're macroscopic. They involve many photons. Mm -hmm. If that's your version of macroscopic, then yes. That's one version. More questions?
None? Okay, so <laughs> continue. But I don't mean to use up all the time. Um, so a lot of people here are sort of coming from a different background, dynamical systems. There's, you know, can I think of coupled pendula, basically, uh, to describe this amplifier? Yeah, absolutely. Coupled classical pendula are like a great way to build this amplifier. And things like varactor diodes, maybe they're not your idea of classical pendula, but they're the electrical analog of them, have definitely been used sort of for many decades as a way to build parametric amplifiers. If they're not in broad industrial use, because this whole business of doubling your noise is not very attractive at, at high temperatures. But definitely people who never thought the word quantum mechanics built parametric amplifiers out of these classical varactor diode objects for a long time before we came along. So, so these are nonlinear systems? That's right. If, if you, you, you can redo this whole derivation from sort of a Kirchhoff's law, and as long as you have one nonlinear element in the system and you drive that nonlinear element appropriately, you can reproduce all this physics. So, so are, are bifurcations an important... Do they occur in this amplification process? Yeah, bifurcation uh, is associated with this sort of um, this high susceptibility point. Mm -hmm. So there are, depending on the flavor of the amplifier, there are different kinds of bifurcation. And there's sort of uh, there's also the entry into chaos, right? In our amplifier systems, we we operate below typically where the bifurcation points happen, and that's pretty easy to keep uh, steady. The, the entry to chaos is, of course, much harder in these dynamical systems to predict. And so uh, it doesn't tend to be that they bifurcate when we don't want them to. It tends to be that uh, you, you try to get to a, an operating point. But if the system goes chaotic before you get there, then the whole amplifier will just sort of dissolve on the VNA screen. So the, the amplification is greatest at the I mean, the system's most sensitive the, at the... The, 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 the great amplification is right is approaching from below. So in VJ's amplifier tomorrow, uh, historically, it was called the JBA, the Josephson Bifurcation Amplifier, okay. and it was used as a bifurcating latching microwave amplifier. To make it a paramp, all we did was move slightly to the right of bifurcation and then identify the parametric gain points. So they're definitely intimately connected to each other. And duffing physics is very, you know, very much the physics that classically analog to what VJ is going to show tomorrow. Okay. The JBA, uh, the my system, the two mode amplifier has more complicated. You know, it can bifurcate in more ways. Uh, but the same underlying idea of sort of chaos bifurcation being states you don't want to enter into when you're trying to amplify is, is, is still there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Up there. Okay, so maybe it's a naive question. So you said I can take a LC circuit and then you call it's, it's a, maybe it's a macroscopic object and then you can call it a uh, quantum harmonic oscillator, right? At, some level That's so right. uh, so i mean uh, so it, is it so when can you do it i mean like do you need a low dissipation and then at low temperatures is that good enough uh okay so you're asking when my harmonic oscillator becomes quantum yeah i mean um you definitely would like to cool it to the ground state so that has something to say about what frequency the harmonic oscillator is compared to what temperature you're physically at um and then you definitely need enough uh that you need the dissipation rate to be low enough that you can actually interact with the object to control it. So my systems are fairly low Q. So their Qs are only like hundreds. But we do cool them down to a physical temperature of 10 millikelvin, which is very uh, low compared to the temperature of a photon in these systems, which would be something like 250, 260 millikelvin. Uh, okay, yes. If you, okay, if you take one of these superconducting circuits here, um, okay, like this one is an amplifier, this one is a qubit. What we do is we basically change the linear parts of the circuit compared to the nonlinear parts of the circuit to enhance or decrease the, the nonlinearity relative to the energy scale. So this circuit's anharmonicities tend to be in the kilohertz range. And its uh, kappas tend to be hundreds of megahertz. So no, there I do not see energy quantization. In fact, the good amplifier be semi-classical in that way. If I take the same ingredients, though, and I pump up the nonlinearity by making the junction physically smaller, then this circuit becomes this transmon qubit, which very cleanly identifies the, 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 the number state transitions of the harmonic oscillator. So, you know, for me, these are all quantum circuits, and I just move 
my nonlinearity versus my kappa, depending on what I'm trying to make. But you know, they're all in this sense quantum. And if you wanted proof, I would refer you to the qubit part of the of what we're going to talk about tomorrow and Friday. Okay. If, if I don't see any further questions, so let's thank Michael again, and this concludes the morning session. Thank you.